Let's begin by welcoming uh, your host for the evening, Pro Vice Chancellor Dana Stan. Well, good evening. Uh, well, our guest this evening is an accomplished business leader, the chief executive of the Camelot Group of Companies, an accomplished woman in a male dominated business world maybe something of a cliche these days. And by the way, in our audience this evening, uh, there are many, uh, many accomplished women, that is, not many cliches. Uh, uh, maybe cliches as well, but nonetheless, um, Diane's accolades are literally too numerous to mention, but they do include Fellowship of the Royal Society of Arts, Fellow of the Marketing Society, Fellow of the Chartered Institute of Marketing, Companion of the Chartered Management Institute, and recipient of the Gold Medal for Leadership, etc., etc., etc. And she is regularly named in the UK's top 100 most influential business leaders. And to add to all of that, she's a former Vive Clico Businesswoman of the Year, was awarded the commander of the British Empire by Her Majesty the Queen, and she is also Chancellor of this great university. And therein, ladies and gentlemen, is the risk this evening. For I have never before interviewed my own Chancellor, and this may be career enhancing <laughs> or career threatening. The next 40 minutes will decide. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to put it to the vote later, uh, if you'll forgive me, uh, but we'll find out uh, which it is, I've no doubt. It's my great pleasure to introduce and welcome Diane Thompson. Music, I did indeed. <laughs> no pressure there then. Okay. Now, we're amongst friends this evening. This is an invited audience. I've personally vetted every single one of them. That's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is my standards are not very high. <laughs> uh, but uh, welcome to MMU in Cheshire, Thank uh, you. Diane, where I say the sun always shines metaphorically, if not always meteorologically, but the sun has certainly been shining for your arrival today, and it's, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here. It's a great pleasure to be here, thank you. you. Your career, which we'll get into, is by any stretch a remarkable one. Chief Executive of Camelot now for 14 years, uh, I think. Tremendously successful stewardship over that time. Camelot has got the license now to run the lottery, until 2023. Uh, here you are, submitting the third <laughs> bid. Uh, what on earth is in all those boxes? I have to tell you, it was 18,000 pages of a submission. <laughs> and we had to give eight copies of it in. So yeah, 18,000, it weighed a quarter of a tonne. That's amazing. Yeah, I know. And, and cost £20 million to do. So a massive, massive that's, undertaking bidding for this. That's some opportunity cost. Certainly just is. for a submission. Yeah, if yeah. you don't win, I mean, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Indeed. Well, we'll come on to some of the losers yeah. a little later, perhaps. Now, if I can be a little personal, you're clearly still a very energised, vibrant person um, with a successful organisation, incredible track record of leadership, but you've announced your retirement. What's the, what's the significance of the timing of that, if any? Um, well, I'd actually announced my retirement for earlier. Uh, the original plan was that I would uh, retire from Camelot in March 2013. Mm. Um, and then about four years ago, Camelot, the, which was owned by five shareholders, uh, UK-based shareholders at the time, uh, was put up for sale and we were bought by a Canadian pension fund. And my dream had always been to... Um, help develop Camelot internationally. The, the problem with running a business like I do is that if all you do is single purpose, i.e. run the UK National Lottery, 
fantastic thing to do, but it does mean it's binary. Every time a bid comes up, you either win or you lose. Mm. And if you don't win, in lottery land, we never talk about losing. It's all about not winning. It's all about winning. Uh, but if you don't win, then the company's finished. And so my dream had always been for us to start doing things internationally right. so that we got other revenue streams just in case the worst, the unforgivable, unthinkable thing could happen mm. and we lost here in the UK. And our new owners were up for that. So they asked me if I would stay until sometime in early 2015. The date's not determined yet. And I've been happy to do that. And uh, we may talk about this later, but actually uh, we won the Irish lottery with them uh, a few weeks ago. And in fact, hopefully the license, sorry, I'm looking at my colleague here in the front row. I think the license is being signed tomorrow. So uh, yeah, we're on our way. It's okay. Great. Okay, opposite. Well, you've certainly earned your retirement. I know there's a lot of speculation in the national press about what you're going to do, and I, and and, and maybe you'll choose to say something about that uh, perhaps later. But um, I know the people in the Isle of Wight are getting very excited for some reason. <laughs> I had two really great pieces of advice given. I'm sure I was given lots of good advice, but two things that stuck with me about retiring. One was. Um, don't retire in the winter if you can avoid it because the days are short, the nights are long, the weather's usually bad, people are scurrying to and from work, mm. curtains are closed and you become very isolated. And you know, I live on my own, I've been on my own for a long, long time. Um, so retire in the summer, kids are on school holidays, parliament's risen, courts are in recess, mm. days are longer if you're lucky like we were last summer, the weather's good. Uh, and people are out and about. And I thought that was really great advice, actually. It was something I would never have thought of. And the other thing that this person said to me was, work out what it is that you love about what you do. And I've been at Camelot 17 years, so there's obviously a lot that I love about it. Uh, work out what it is that you love um, and work out the things that you don't like particularly and try and make sure that what you do going forward builds on what you love and has as little of the things you don't like and if you'd have asked me before I started thinking about this, I would have said to you, when I finish at Camelot, my next job is a, a portfolio career. Mm. Lots of non-execs, you know, which a lot of people who've been through the sort of career path that I have end up doing. And I worked out the two things I absolutely hate about my job is reading board papers and going to board meetings. <laughs> yes. and, and it was sort of that light bulb moment. And I thought, God, you know, I really yeah. don't want a portfolio career. What yeah. I love is business. I love being hands-on. I love being able to make a difference, take decisions. And so, yeah, there's a strong rumour that I'm actually buying a hotel on the Isle like, of Wight. So um, yeah. watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Let's, let's, uh, let's rewind a little bit in your life to sort of where it all started. You were brought up, I know, in in West Yorkshire. I um, was. Your family uh, was a, a, a very big influence. Um, <coughs> he's your, yeah. your mother and father. Um, they were a strong influence, I know. They, they were. Um, my, my, my dad's still alive. He's uh, 88, very frail now, not doing too well. Sadly, my mum died nearly 30 years ago. Um, but they were really hard workers. They got married uh, just at the end of the war. They had no money. And, um, you know, they just worked. But what their influence on me was, they led me to believe that if you work hard, you can achieve anything. Uh, and the fact that you come from a fairly poor background, as we did, you know, it has nothing to do with it. If, if you prepare to put the mm -hmm. effort in. Yes. And uh, they were a great influence on me because they both worked really hard. My dad was a butcher, my mum worked in a Clark's shoe shop as a fitting specialist for mm -hmm. most of her working life. Um, I hadn't realised until, and this is going to sound really silly, but I hadn't realised until a few years ago that actually we didn't have weekends like I have weekends now. They worked. Saturday was their busiest day. So our weekend would start, I'm an only child, uh, our weekend would start at 7 o'clock when they got home from closing their respective shops. Um, but... I felt that they drove me, and I've been driven all my career, if I'm totally honest. And I remember as a child once saying to my mum and dad, why didn't you have, you know, like, oh, only kids do. Oh, I'd like a brother or I'd like a sister, you know. Why didn't you have more kids? And they said, because we wanted to give you the opportunities that we didn't have. Mm. And I think in the nicest sense, that sort of put the monkey on my shoulder. And mm. I just felt I really had to prove to them that them only having one child... Yeah. I would actually 
get what they wanted for me just just so their sacrifice was worth it yeah so but you know great values great role models and yeah, uh, yeah. and your roots in west yorkshire yeah, I was born in a place called Dewsbury, yeah. uh, but lived in Batley till I was 18. Great rugby league side, Dewsbury. Abs absolutely. And I uh, lived near Mount Pleasant, actually, in yeah, Batley right. as well. Yeah. Uh, came over to Manchester to go uh, to college here and lived 18 years in Yorkshire, 18 years in a combination of Greater Manchester and Cheshire. Right. Uh, so I would call myself a northerner. Okay. And you can tell by my accent, yeah, can't you? As soon as I'm back that. here, it comes out thicker and thicker. Well, you're in, good, you're in good company here, I can assure you. What was Diane the youngster, the teenager, like? Were you studious, rebellious? I don't think I was ever rebellious, to be honest. I look back, perhaps it would have been nice to have had that phase, but I don't think I ever was. I worked hard. I wasn't particularly academically bright, but I did OK because I worked really hard. Mm. Um, I had lots of friends, um, and I remember sort of lots of great times being out on bicycles yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. That's in the, in the, well, we shared that era when it was, um, it was the norm, actually, to be outside. And yeah, it was. A it lot, was, yeah. and no one was concerned about. I know. And times have changed, of course. Very sadly. Uh, and, and then you, you, studied, you studied French at university? I did French and English. Uh, probably the biggest... Um, mistake I think uh, looking back my headmistress I was at a, a grammar school in Batley and my headmistress was in hindsight a bit of a snob no I take that back she was a hell of a snob actually <laughs> 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 and um, she really didn't approve of red brick universities right. so I had a place to do French at Reading and she wouldn't let me take it. She was a, she was a very powerful lady. Uh, and so what I got was a University of London place, but mm. to do it external okay. at, at the Polytechnic here in Manchester. And she thought that was better than actually going to a red brick university because it was University of London. As it happened, it, yeah, I, th I think from a course point of view, it mm. was totally the wrong choice. But from coming to Manchester and being yeah. part of this great city, of course, yeah. it was a great choice. So undergraduate life was something you, you enjoyed largely? I did enjoy it, although, I mean, we all, all of us who know the university uh, know that actually, uh, I mean, I was based in A-Town Street. Yes, right. Where later I was back in A-Town Street. You were working, Street. yeah. Uh, there was no campus then in those days. And so you, as a student, you were quite isolated. You came into college to do whatever lectures or tutorials or whatever you were doing, mm. and then you went home. There yeah. was, you know, there was the odd mm. gig on a Friday or Saturday evening, but there mm. was no sort of central hub, really, mm. and particularly at Eightown Street, because you were sort of a long way away from the student union mm. as well. Mm. Mm. So I, I sort of regret... I, actually, I don't... Sorry, I take that back. I don't regret anything. Life's too short for regrets. Mm. But I think the benefit that of going to somewhere like Reading would have done would have given a campus environment yeah. and a different experience. Yeah. I have to say the thing that I find, having, having been a dean in Manchester and a dean here, here at Cheshire, is this campus environment, yeah. self-contained. People live here as well yeah. as study yeah. here. It's, it's, it's actually rather special. Yeah, it is. It's actually rather wonderful. And I think for, for a young person going to college, if you can get that experience yeah. rather than what I had, I think that's so much better. Yeah. You mentioned the Polytechnic. As, as the institution was before it was yeah. incorporated in 1992, uh, and the A-Town Street. Uh, th this actually is um, fortuitous, this picture, because it's, it's a picture of, of um, the library that surrounds the 60s, um, 11, I think it was 11-storey concrete monstrosity. It was horrible. Absolutely <laughs> horrible. And I remember being influential in building this library and my primary motive was that it wouldn't it would hide the building behind it <laughs> well uh, which he did very successfully it did, it did. but this this was the then business school uh, and um, and as you said having been or been on a University of London program uh, studying here you joined this institution Manchester Polytechnic yeah. to, to to lecture in marketing I think uh, in the I, 80s I did I, I joined the business studies department and I, my first first real assignments were business policy and business strategy. I had to say I'd never read a textbook in my life on business and I was about six weeks ahead of the students, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. as you do the first year. But then I was really lucky. Uh, I didn't see myself staying here for a long time. I, I saw it as a, 
an interim. Uh, I'd been employed by ICI Paints Division out in Hyde um, and I decided to leave there and wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. So I got a job here as a senior lecturer uh, and thought I'd perhaps be here for two or three years. But I got some great opportunities. I actually worked on the first uh, ever retail marketing degree yeah. here in uh, yeah. the UK. And mm -hmm. then also I worked on the advertising degree. Mm -hmm. So each time I thought, oh, yeah, I've come to the end of what I came to do. Mm -hmm. There was a new challenge. So I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. No, I, I studied in this same business school as a mature student when you were lecturing there yeah uh and uh we 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 only met on one occasion uh, which i remember sadly you don't but <laughs> you made more of an impact <laughs> on, on on me than than Sorry, i Dennis. did on you uh, uh but um i mean there were some terribly talented and gifted uh, academics and commercially experienced people in that department, I remember. Names which won't mean much to our audience, but I remember people like Mike Webb, Fred Scholes, yeah, yeah. John Killer, uh, spring to mind. Yeah. I mean, they were still so engaged in the commercial sector as well as been academics. And that's something I've enjoyed in my whole academic life, the opportunity still to be doing other things uh, alongside that. And I know that at the time you were a senior lecturer here, you were also still running your own business in Manchester. Yeah, I was very lucky. Um, uh, and it was all done with the uh, what was then the Polytechnic's blessing. Uh, I had the opportunity to start my own advertising agency in Manchester. Um, and it was a real win-win for the university and for me. I'd had to take quite a substantial pay decrease mm -hmm. to leave ICI to go into academia. Uh, and at that time, obviously, the poly was trying to encourage more people to come from industry. So they had to give them a bit of flexibility to be able to earn uh, monies other than standard lecturers pay. Mm. And I had this opportunity to start my own ad agency and it worked out really well in that uh, it was only just up Minchell Street, so it wasn't far away. Mm. Uh, so I could be up and down in 10 minutes. But we took students, placement students, mm. and gave them jobs, work experience mm. in the agency. And I had a, a group of clients who were prepared to come into uh, the college and actually do guest lectures and uh, do mm. case studies and whatever. Mm. So it worked for everybody, and it was the stimulation I needed from outside, like you're saying, you get. Well, it, was what, it certainly worked for the students, because I remember as a mature student feeling really fortunate that um, not only did you have academics who were actually very accomplished in the discipline and in the research they were doing, but, they, but that was, that was practically based discipline because they were engaged in real organisations, mm. yeah. doing real things and uh, sort of walking the talk. Yes. And, yeah. and so that old maxim about if you can't do it, teach it, was never, ever the case no. in, in a business school like that. No. Uh, nor is it still uh, to this day, uh, uh, nor should it be. Um, but you stayed for about seven years, yep. which is a little longer than you'd planned. Yeah, a bit longer, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then you, you left you, and you had a series of appointments. I remember you were, you were marketing director of Woolworths. I think that was about 92, early 90s at least. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then you moved to Signet PLC as, uh, as marketing director in 94. Now, Signet was the remnants of... Uh, Ratners, the jewellers. Uh, now, as, as you can see from many of our... Well, actually, you can't see them because they're in, they're in darkness. Uh, and actually, I have to say, without being indiscreet, some of them look better in the dark than they do <laughs> in the daylight. I've, I know most of them. Um, but th th we're all, many of us are old enough to remember, of course, the infamous remark yes. of Gerald Ratner uh, when he... he I think referred to some of his product lines as, quote, total crap. Now, to take over <laughs> did. the task of rescuing that business, mm. uh, which you did, well, then there were challenges and then there were challenges, and that was one of the latter, surely. Yes, it was. Um, and I can honestly say uh, I was there for three years, and they are the hardest three years of my entire really? career. I can't remember laughing once, and I'm really? a, normally I'm a happy, smiley person. Um, Gerald had actually milked the business um, really badly. I mean, he spent £12 million buying a helicopter. He'd had two gyms put in, one at head office 
in uh, just off um, Piccadilly, more or less by the Ritz. And um, he'd had one put on the top of the offices, which used to be the old H. Samuel offices in Collingdale. And money was no object. Uh, so there'd be no reinvestment in the stores, no investment in stock. And he, he, he actually made two jokes. Um, the occasion that he did this was at um, an IOD, an Institute of Directors mm. annual yes. conference. Um, which was being held at the Royal Albert Hall because F.W. de Klerk was the keynote speaker. And Gerald was following F.W. de Klerk and had been told to make it funny. So he made two jokes. The first was, people say to me, how can you... you see, he's scarred. I'm scarred yeah, yeah, yeah. by this. But he said, how can you... How, people say to me, how can you sell a decanter and six glasses on a silver-looking tray for 6 99 And the answer is, it's total crap. And the second joke was um, people see us selling uh, earrings for £2.99. Yes, we do, but they don't last as long as a Marks and Spencer's prawn sandwich. And, of course, the media, the tabloids in particular, got it. And the next day, the headlines were, Ratner says it's C, asterisk, asterisk, P. Yeah. And the business, uh, it, their year end is end of January, and they'd made a profit of £125 million. Uh, he made the speech in April. The following January, it was a loss of 122 million. Incredible. You know, how the business didn't go bust, I don't know, really. Mm -hmm. And so that was the challenge. A new team were brought in, can we save it? And we did. We did, but it was sheer hard grind. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you were there for three years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, in general terms, having worked for Woolworths and so on, what, what was it like in the, as I said in the introduction, perhaps women in a, an accomplished woman in a, in a predominantly male business world is a cliche now. There's a lot more illustrations, thankfully, of, um, yeah. of, 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 of a female success, and quite rightly. But that wasn't the case in the 80s and 90s. What was it like? No, it wasn't. It was, it was tough, to be perfectly honest. And I'm, you know, I'm really delighted because I've got a daughter who's 30 this year. I'm delighted it's changed. But I remember um, at my interview, I should, silly the things that stay with you all these years, isn't mm. it? But my interview for ICI, I was told in my interview that to be treated equal to the men, I had to be at least 10% better. Mm. And I said with absolute false bravado, that's okay, I'll be 15%, no problem there then. And then coming out thinking, oh my God, can yeah. I do this? You know? <laughs> but there was an interesting turning point in my career. I, um, I was approached and I was at Sterling Roncraft who made Ron Seal Varnish. Um, and uh, the company was bought by an American uh, company, Eastman Kodak, actually. And um, they made some big mistakes uh, in terms of how they handled us. And they said publicly on Wall Street that they were probably going to divest us. As it happened, they didn't in the end, but we all thought our jobs were at stake. So everybody started looking for another job. And I got a job as managing director of a Swedish steel company called Sandvik, which some of the guys here might know because they're very world famous for making hand saws uh, amongst other hand tools. And that was the tipping point in my career because it was very much a male industry, yes. as you can imagine hand tools yes. would be. I was the first female MD of any DIY company in the UK. And I got in to see people that my predecessor, who was a male, had never been able to get into. And I found that suddenly the attitude shifted. And instead of having to prove myself that I was better than the guys to be treated equal, mm. suddenly people were saying, my God, it's a woman at the top. She must be good. Mm. <laughs> and I didn't have to prove myself at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they just all assumed I was good. Mm. So uh, it was a real tipping point. But, you know, I'm delighted to say those days have gone. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I look at a company like Camelot now and we employ about 50-50 male to female. And, mm. you know, your, your sex, your, your gender, your religion, your colour. I mean, mm. none of that none of it matters. matters. Mm. It's just about... Who's the best person for the job? Yeah, thank goodness. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now you mentioned Camelot, so let let let's turn to Camelot, and and you you joined Camelot in ninety seven, I think. First, of course, as operations director. Yeah. Uh, and then from two thousand as, uh, as as chief executive, uh, and of course you came to, if I may say, so real national prominence as uh, as chief executive of Camelot and the, the launch of the lottery in the UK. And we have a picture of you. This is quite a recent picture of yeah, you with John is. Major. 
uh, celebrating, I think, the anniversary. The 18th birthday, yeah. Yeah, 18 years now. Yeah, it was 19 now. That yeah. was earlier last yeah. year, yeah. Yeah. Uh, John Major, of course, Prime Minister at the time. That must have been really exciting because uh, n not only was it a new, a new venture, it was an unknown venture in the UK. Yeah, it was. I didn't actually join right at the start. The lottery launched in November 94 and I came uh, in February 97. And I have to be honest, I got a call from a headhunter and I've been very lucky in my career that I've worked for nine companies and six of them have had calls from headhunters, you know, so, which is a very, very fortunate place to be. Got a call from a headhunter saying, there's this job going at Camelot, are you interested? I said, no. No, I'm not interested. Because what my career has really been typified about is making a difference. Right. And that's what I'm really passionate mm. about. Mm. And Camelot launched incredibly well in November 94. I've got lots of friends in the media, and I know that the tabloids had two front pages ready to run. Um, lottery fiasco, lottery success. And, of course, they switched it on. John Major bought the first ticket, and it was a huge success. Yes, yeah. And um, sales were far higher than anybody had anticipated they would be. And at the start of 97, it was just all going great. You know, there was nothing wrong. People didn't know who Camelot was. It was just the lottery was exciting. Mm. And I just thought, I can't make a difference here. And the guy, the headhunter actually was a mate, and he said, Di, do me a favour, let me put you on the list, because I need to give them a good candidate list. This is my first assignment okay. with them, you know. <laughs> you favours, so, yes. Yeah, yeah, so sort of <laughs> rent, rent a crowd, you know, get on the list. So I went, and my predecessor, and actually, I mean, Camelot's remarkable in that sense too, because here we are, 19 years old, and there's only ever been two CEOs. But he showed me a graph, and the graph sort of went like that, plateaued, and then went down. And he said, that's what happens in every lottery in the world, and it's absolutely true, absolutely true. So you start off, people get very excited, lottery sales grow, and then it peaks. Right. And then after a while, people realise that with odds of 14 million to one, it could be you, but it might not be. And people drop out of the game. And then the real challenge is, once you go into decline, can you get it back into growth? And he said, that's what your challenge here would be. Right. We were still going up at that stage. Right. We plattered in 98. This was 90, 96 when I first met him. He said, you know, the challenge if you come is that will inevitably happen. Can you get it back up the other side? Right. And that's why I went. Right. Fantastic. Yeah. And I, I mean, in, in 2001, of course, uh, the initial bid was unsuccessful. And uh, this guy, <laughs> uh, the People's Lottery, yeah. Uh, won initially, uh, and then you won on appeal after judicial review, yeah. I think. And um, uh, that must have been quite a moment. I, it was, I, I think the worst, the worst moment was the day that we lost, which was August 23rd at one minute past 11. <laughs> Not that it's etched in your mind. I know. Terribly. I know. And you know, you know what it's like... Um, you're interpreting everything in the lead up to, is that a good sign, is that a good sign? And there was only Richard, well, sorry, actually, there were three bidders. There was Richard and ourselves who'd done serious bids, and then some random guy went into the Lottery Commission with an envelope <laughs> and <laughs> his envelope in. So I don't know who he was, we never found out. But um, we, we thought we were going to win. We'd done a pretty good job. Uh, I wasn't CEO then, obviously, mm. um, and I look mm. back and I think perhaps actually we were a bit arrogant, but we thought we were going to win, and we debated, you know, who, uh, he's going uh, second in terms of being told whether he's won or not, we're first, they probably think that the winner will be able to keep their mouth shut longer than somebody who's lost, you know, we analysed everything yeah, you do to all destruction, those yeah. and uh, so we were absolutely shocked. Absolutely mm. shocked when we won. Uh, well, sorry, when, when we lost. lost. Mm. And it was a really tough day for me personally because uh, I wasn't CEO, but I'd been the person who put the bid in, so I was the media face. Um, and I, I had to go and give all the media interviews about, you know, it was, it was awful. Mm. And um, that evening I was what's called duty director at Camelot, and every time there was a live draw in those days, a member of a, a director was physically present in the uh, operations room, and it was my job. It was a Wednesday, 
And uh, so I finished work. I, I did all the media, went back to work, supervised the draw, finished at 10. And a lot of people were down in a, wait, a Yates's Wine Lodge in Watford, which is not the most salubrious of places, <laughs> I can yes, tell you. And uh, I called in just to have a quick drink with the team. And, you know, people were in tears and it was awful. And I'd bought myself a new... Sorry, this is too much information for the guy. Sorry. <laughs> but I bought myself a new brown and cream dress and a cream jacket for this day. And uh, when I got home that night, I put it away in the wardrobe and I didn't look at it again for a long, long time because it was, had such bad memories. I got it out about six months later and it was absolutely covered in lager stains because people going, oh, die! <laughs> 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 and I was drenched. <laughs> I mean, of course, you won on appeal. We did. Well, we, we did the judicial review, yeah. got back in the race, and then uh, we had Lord Terry Burns, the guy who uh, runs Santander. Yeah. He came in to do the new evaluation, yeah. and we won. Yeah. And I, I read an article, um, and I reminded myself of a reason. I've got it, I've got, I've got it referenced here. Um, and the article suggested that when it came to playing business hardball, um, and and I, I, I quote, your B-A-L-L-S proved to be bigger than his. Uh, a dubious accolade, I suggest. <laughs> I know. I know. I actually fatally made the mistake once of saying, yes, I've got balls. Balls of steel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that does keep coming up from time to time. Moving on. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Someone once said you can't win everything. And, of course, this yeah. um, was something that you also took to review and appeal. Um, but weren't successful, uh, yeah. and so on. And I, I remember um, hearing you speak about a year ago, around the time when actually that was still going on. Um, <laughs> what were your what, what were your uh, your fundamental yeah. objections to the health lottery? Yeah, I have a real um, problem with that. Um, there are about seven hundred what are called society lotteries here in the UK. Um, they're mainly uh, created to support one individual charity. Uh, I have a girlfriend who's a fund manager of a hospice in Tamworth in Arden. They run their own lottery. That's absolutely fine. No, no threat right. to the national lottery, and we're no threat to them. Right. Instead of just rattling a tin and you put your pound in, you might get a scratch card or something. You know, it, it, It's part of how they raise their money. And we've peacefully coexisted for 19 years. Right. Uh, and the rules are very clear. If you're a society lottery, you're a charity, you only have to give 20% back to your charity, the good cause, and you don't pay any tax, mm. whereas we pay 12% lottery duty. What Richard's done, and this is Richard Desmond, who owns Northern and Shell, he's, he's actually got 51 of these small society lotteries, but put them together as a national lottery. We sell in about 37,000 outlets up and down the UK. He's in 41,000. He's nationally advertising. It's not yeah. like a, a little charity in Tamworth and Arden, you right. know, which are no threat to the National Lottery. Mm. He's a National Lottery. He's mm. bigger than we are mm. in terms of where his distribution is. Mm. And my worry about it is not so much Richard. You know, At the moment, we think he's doing, I don't know, £2 million pounds worth of sales a week, and I do £120 million pounds worth of sales a week. So... You know, it's not a threat in that sense, right. but it's the precedent. Right. And he hasn't had much support from any other of the media owners because obviously they're competitors. Mm. But if it was Tesco, and Tesco, who obviously are media buyers of all the national media, yeah. they would feel obliged to supply them and, and mm. support them. And so I'm not worried about Richard per se, although I did try to stop it, obviously. Um, but it's the precedent that it's setting that's a real threat. OK, that's clear. Now, you know, we all love a little bit of tittle-tattle and gossip about lottery winners. Mm. As there's quite remarkable ones. You must have met some of them. Here's some of them. This is actually a very remarkable couple. They are. Um, I'm not really supposed to have favourites, but I have to tell you, these are my favourites. This is Ray and Barbara Rag, and they won about £7.4 million. And they've given over £5 million pounds of it away. Remarkable. And um, they were very smart. They, they paid off their mortgage, moved house, but only from something fairly modest to something slightly less modest. You know, they didn't do what some of them do and go from something small to the big mansion. Uh, they gave some money to um, kids and 
They have two sets of close friends. They paid their mortgages off and gave them some money. They live in Sheffield, so it's not like sort of being in Knightsbridge in London. It didn't take a lot. But it meant they got some playmates. Their, their friends retired, and so they got some friends around them. Mm. But what they've done since then is just give the money away. And if Barbara was here tonight, she would say to you, it's better to give than to receive. And they're the sort of people I'm sure we'd all wish we could be. Mm. They'll read something in the press, mm. I don't know, a child that needs an operation that can only be done in the States and the parents can't afford to go, and they'll go in and they'll sort it. Incredible. They've taken war vets back to the Normandy beaches. They take 200 disabled kids to Disney on ice every Christmas. Wonderful. You know, they, they are just the most remarkable people. And can I tell you my, mm. one of my favourite lottery stories about them? I love, I love meeting lottery winners, and I always like to know where they were when they found out they'd won. And their story is they were at home. It was a Saturday night. They'd watched the draw show. They checked their numbers, and they knew they'd won on Saturday night. Didn't tell anybody. Sunday, rang Camelot and checked again, and um, they actually were definite winners. So they talked during Sunday what they were going to do, and Barbara was uh, a night ward sister in the... Uh, children's ward at the Hallamshire Hospital in Sheffield and Ray was a plumber so Ray rang his boss on the Sunday evening who was called Fred I promise you <laughs> and said it's a good plumber's name yeah it, it is <laughs> he said Fred you know Barbara and I we're going on a bit and we, we because Barbara works nights you know we don't get to spend much time together and and so we've been talking about it this weekend and we've decided we're going to retire um, so I'm not coming in tomorrow <laughs> and Fred, Fred apparently said you've won the lottery yeah. and Ray said well yeah actually I have Fred said I haven't checked my tickets Ray said don't bother I've won the bloody lot <laughs> <laughs> I promise you that is true that is wonderful um some other winners. I mean, I can really, I'm a bit of a petrol head. You know, I, I have a um, soft spot for cars, so I can sort of relate to, to these people. Tom and Rita. Yeah, Tom and Rita Naylor. And um, Tom is into cars, as you can see. They, too, have done uh, great things for charity. They won a bit more. They won just over 14 million. And um, Barbara's into diamonds. Oh, my God. <laughs> Has she got diamonds? But they were fantastic because they, um, they came down to Camelot um, to come and get their check at head office in Watford. And they were asked if they would go on the sofa GMTV on the Tuesday morning. And I'd asked my um, team who look after uh, the winners to see whether on their way back, and they too are in the sort of West Midlands area, whether they would be prepared to come to Watford and meet the people. Because, right. of course, I get to meet winners, but a lot of my staff don't. And they absolutely were up for this. They did come to Watford. They did GMTV, came out to Watford and literally shook everybody's hand, at the entire building. And there would have been probably 500 people there. And they went round everybody. But the only problem was that every time you said, or anybody said to um, uh, Rita, how much did you win? She said 14 million and burst into tears. She, she just couldn't deal with it. But now she's one of uh, Boodle and Dunthorne's biggest <laughs> customers. <Sure, hold> <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I think I'm um, like saying these are the biggest winners so far. Uh, these are the Weirs uh, in Largs in Scotland, 161 million. Wow, imagine that. Yeah. So, well, you can't imagine that actually. No, but, it, but I mean. That you, you find uh, two or three types of people take publicity. 80% of people don't take any publicity. The people who do either have won so much money that you can't hide it, and if you're going to do some good with it, then lots of people are going to find out about it anyway. So better to be on the front foot, and people like my colleague Charlotte here from the publicity team will actually manage that experience for them and protect them and look after them. Yes. Uh, so either you've won so much money you can't hide it, you're potentially in a syndicate and you think you might be able to keep it quiet, but you're always relying on the other members of the syndicate themselves to keep it quiet. And so quite often syndicates will take publicity. And then sadly, the third type of people who'd end up taking publicity are those where some of the tabloids will still pay you 500 quid if you can shop a winner. Oh. Uh, and it tends to be extended family. Mm. 
um, some real human interest stories. Yeah, yeah. In, in, and in these. most of them are absolutely fantastic. I mean, we, we have had, and I'm sure you've all read about them, the odd one or two who have not dealt with their winnings too well. Yeah. We have a great team of trade counsellors. We have winners' advisors. You know, we'll hold your hand the entire way. And we're still in touch with a lot of our very early winners. But some people just don't want our help. See, I'm of an age where I remember, and it was dramatised on TV, um, the um, the pools winner in the 60s, Vivian. She was from Yorkshire. Bib Nichols. Spend, spend, spend. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's quite... Uh, so I guess there are still sort of illustrations of that sort there of behaviour well. but, but they are in the minority. But they're minority. Yeah. OK, well, uh, now, um, moving on. In 2006, a very proud <laughs> honour and day. I bet your dad was very proud. He was. He uh, was. Receiving the CBE. Chocolate biscuit eater. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, that, <laughs> that would be a great day, I've no doubt. It was. It was very, very special. It was, um, it was such a shock. Um, <laughs> and I remember, it's funny, isn't it, the silly things that stay with you, but I remember getting home very late one night mm. and I'd had a very stressful day, something fairly mega had gone wrong. And I got home and I was sort of quite angry and um, I grabbed the post out of, out of the letterbox and I, I remember ever so clearly being in the kitchen just ripping envelopes open, you know, to see what was in the post, bills, bills, bills. And then there was this letter, I hadn't even looked on the envelope and it, it just said... Um, dear Miss Thompson, if the Prime Minister were minded to recommend to Her Majesty the Queen that you should receive the honour of CBE, would you be minded to accept? <laughs> 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 yeah. And I'm looking, and I remember shaking, absolutely shaking. Yeah, but it was a wonderful day. I had you're allowed, or I was allowed to take three people, so I had my dad there. Mm. I had my daughter, um, and this was, as you say, in 2006, so she would have been about 22, and I had my PA there, because my PA, who's worked with me for 11 years, she's sort of the wind beneath my wings, and I wouldn't have been there if it hadn't been for her. So, mm. Mm. yeah, we went together. It was Fantastic. Great. I want to move us on to um, London 2012, uh, because I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that without the lottery... London 2012 would not have been, well, it may still have happened, but it wouldn't remotely have been the games that it was. And here you are, the picture of you presenting a cheque for 750 million, which was just an instalment <laughs> in the 2.2 billion. And, and also in that video clip, we, uh, we saw uh, Dame Sarah's story, uh, an honour and a yeah. great ambassador for the university, of course, was, was with us a few months ago yeah. for the first in yeah. this series. And so as um, uh, in training uh, now, has already won a world championship um, for, since she, uh, she returned after the birth of her daughter, Louisa. And she and Barney are both in the environment chambers um, currently. No, I mean, not presently, yeah. this moment, but uh, certainly this week here at uh, uh, Exercise and Sports Science. Now, I know you've been a very, right the way through, from the very beginning, you've been a terribly passionate advocate for the Games. But what I didn't know until you told me about it earlier was the Tony Blair story about your engagement, Camelot's engagement. Would yes. you, and I'm sure people yes. here don't know about that, Diane. Um, I got a call. Tony Blair um, phoned the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, uh, who are our sponsoring department in government, and asked them to contact me to see how much money I could um, commit to raising for the Games. Uh, he wasn't looking for a personal guarantee, and to be frank, I wouldn't have given one. <laughs> but he did want a commitment as to how much we thought we could do. And uh, the 750 um, that was there, 750 um, million, was the amount of extra money that we thought we could do on top. And so we, my team and I worked out and gave them a figure, and it was on the basis of that figure that Tony Blair gave the go-ahead to bid for the Games. So if it hadn't been for the National Lottery, they wouldn't have bid, um, mm. which is great. And, you know, I sit here and I'm incredibly proud watching that film. Well, you ought but, to be. you know, it's not yeah. our money, it's our players' money. You yeah, know, sure. these genuinely were the people's games. It mm. was their money that enabled this to happen. But it's nice to hear the athletes recognising that. Yes, and, it is. And you saw it again in Sochi, 
yes. l this last week and the yes. week before, again and again. Which was great, wasn't it? It was, it it was absolutely it was fabulous. Mm -hmm. and, and there was talk at one stage about you heading low cog. I did get approached, yes. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. But I love what I do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, you're very good at building things. I've noticed that. Uh, including here at the university, oh, yeah. and here you are in a high vis. Not the most flattering photograph, but no. you've never been shy at getting stuck in, Diane. No. And uh, I think this was our new business school. Yes, it something was something like an eighty million pound yeah. investment, which we're which we're very proud of. Uh, and of course, um, well, uh, as you built the Olympic Stadia, uh, metaphorically at least, yeah. if not personally. Uh, am I right in guessing that you didn't have to apply for online for tickets for the games? Uh, we did, actually. <laughs> no. We did. Uh, I personally, in my own personal capacity, applied online and didn't get any. Okay. Can you believe that? I didn't get any. The only thing that made me feel really uh, good about that was that two or three other people who were very influentially involved in the games didn't get any either. <laughs> right. But we did actually buy sponsorship packages to take some players, some retailers, you know, some of our key stakeholders down there. So I was down in the Olympic Park quite a bit. Yeah, it was... An unbelievable, unbelievable experience, it wasn't was. it? It was great. Uh, the whole thing. And, and um, uh, I remember Denise and I were down in London for, a, um, for a, a, an event with Sir Philip Craven, who, for the Paralympics, yeah. which followed. And, even, and, it, and it carried on into the Paralympics. The Paralympics were amazing, just, they were, weren't they? Yeah. I mean, yeah. some of the statistics, um, apparently the week before the uh, uh, Paralympic Games in Athens opened, they sold a million tickets. Sorry, I beg your pardon. I take that back. They sold a thousand tickets. The week before the Paralympics started in Beijing, uh, they'd actually sold twenty thousand. Mm. The week before the games opened in London, we sold a million. Uh, amazing. Mm. I mean, it's put Paralympics on a totally oh, no, different absolutely. scale. Absolutely. And Sarah gave um, uh, an excellent presentation when she was here, talking about her experience. Actually, she's been in five Paralympic games, which is quite amazing. amazing. It is amazing. And so really the development and the growth of the Paralympics. Yeah. And um, again, we're very pleased as a university that Sir Philip Craven, who lives close, actually his home, although he spends a lot of time overseas, and again is an ambassador of M MMU, I think we all recognise has just been so personally influential. Yeah. And we're very pleased he's just been re-elected as president it's of the International Paralympic it? Committee. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, but um, the feel-good factor of London goes on, and rightly so, and, it's, uh, mm. um, and, and the contribution that, uh, uh, that, that Camelot and the lottery has made has just been uh, fantastic, it really has. And as Pro Vice Chancellor International, as I travel the world, people are still talking about the London yeah. Games. Um, I think it was very special. I mean, if you were down in London, um, none of the horror stories that people worried yeah. about, the security, yeah. the transport links, you know, it, it all worked so yeah. smoothly. Yeah. But I think it was the games makers, you know, the volunteers yeah. that just mm. created mm. such a fun, welcoming atmosphere in London. Mm. It was just amazing to be part of. And when you think, I mean, we spent a lot of money collectively, didn't we, as a nation, 8.8 .8 billion, I think it was. But look at Sochi, it's just cost 30 billion. 30 billion, yeah. Yeah. Incredible. We did an amazing job. We should all be very proud of yeah. this because I think. It didn't fantastic. feel like it was on a budget, did it? It at didn't the time. at all. No, no not, not at, all. at all. Okay, now I want to turn to your, your Chancellor of the University, as I said. Yep. Um, and uh, I find generally that, you know, members of the public, people outside the university, don't necessarily understand these distinctions that we're familiar with, Chancellor. Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, yeah. and, and as a Pro Vice Chancellor, I get asked. In fact, I, only a few days ago, someone said to me, "Dennis, what's the difference between a Pro Vice Chancellor and a Vice Chancellor?" And I said, "Well, actually, it's very simple. It's about two hundred thousand pounds a year." <laughs> <laughs> but as Chancellor, you don't get paid at all. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what, what was it like when you were asked, what did you feel like when you were asked to be Chancellor? Oh, I was, I was absolutely blown away. I mean, as, as we said earlier, I was a student here, I was a lecturer here, I got my first honorary doctorate at MMU, yeah. which was very, very special. Um, and then John Brooks came to see me and um, to talk about whether I would be, I would consider being Chancellor, I mean, would I consider being Chancellor? Um, such a great honour, such a great honour, I can't tell you, I am so proud, 
I'm so proud of this and I love it. I love it. I try and split the 18 graduation ceremonies, although yes. I think we've got more this year, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I try and split those <laughs> with John. And you know, that is su such a great honour, although yeah. when it was very hot in uh, yeah, Bridgewater, Bridgewater Hall, it wasn't that mm. great last mm. summer, was it? But mm. you know, mm. it's just such wonderful. And I just love seeing young people having achieved and coming out. And well, all the robes are very heavy, of course, which can be, but there's more gold on the Chancellor's robe than anyone else's. Well, gold braid. there's sort of quite an interesting story about that, because I'm only the third Chancellor that you you've had. And the first Chancellor was the Duke of Westminster. And, of course, he's quite tall. For anybody who's seen him, he's mm -hmm. quite tall. And so he could carry very heavy gold mm. embroidery. Mm. And then Dame Janet Smith was your second mm -hmm. Chancellor, and she's much taller than I am. Not as tall as the Duke of Westminster, but still very tall. So the, the tradition is that the robes get passed on. So her robes were sort of shortened, but she still had all the gold. And of course, then they got me. And I'm so short by comparison that what they had to do was to unpick all the embroidery, make a small robe, and then put it all on. So the proportionate weight on me is much heavier yeah, okay. than it has been on the others. <laughs> I hadn't thought of it in those terms. Yeah, it is very heavy. Um, do you approve of what we've done to the institution since oh, you were with us in the 80s? Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm so proud every time I go into the centre of Manchester, you know, that whole area. Although I've been blown away by what you've got here, mm. which I think is fantastic, and I love the campus here. But, you know, the, the business school, I think, is outstanding. The art and design facilities now are just amazing. Mm. Yeah, I think it's been a great time for MMU. They really are world class. I mean, that's no, not fantastic. an exaggeration. No, absolutely not. Well, Diane, I can tell you that we think you're a terrific chancellor. Oh, no, so not just because I want to keep my job. <laughs> now, that takes money. <laughs> okay. But because you embody all that's best about this great university. From grounded beginnings, you've achieved great things, and you're a passionate ambassador, as we've heard for the university. However, what, what I find most engaging about you, Diane, chancellor, is that you were your greatness lightly. And we're looking forward very much to your keynote address in about 15 minutes. But for the moment, ladies and gentlemen, Diane Thompson.